Um, so fortunately, because of James Wald's talk, I don't have to explain what supersessionism or replacement theology is. So let me skip the theological discussion and turn to the psychological. Here we encounter a phenomenon that shares with uh, <coughs> Here we encounter a phenomenon of malicious envy, namely the envy that when it sees the other have something desired, sees the other's possession as diminishing the self. Malicious envy cannot share such a prize. It must take it from the envied one and, if not, destroy it. In game theory, this is known as hard zero-sum thinking. While you may win, in other words, have the treasured thing, I lose. In order for me to win, you must lose. I take it away from you. One of the great pleasures that such insecurity feeds on is uh, known in German as Schadenfreude. Nothing pleases a supersessionist more than looking down their disapproving noses at their rivals. Broadly speaking, supersessionism expresses a status anxiety that needs visible proof of superiority in order to reassure itself. It's a kind of invidious identity formation. I aggrandize the new me by diminishing the old you. Like the kind of honor-shame dynamics delineated in a brilliant French movie called Ridicule, or in David Price Jones' book on Arab culture, The Close Circle, this is about honor established through shaming others. And this means that the new supersessionist belief system needs to denigrate the one it claims to replace. Indeed, a supersessionist theology is a machine built to feed this need to denigrate the predecessor. The profundity of the spiritual insecurity here is virtually bottomless leaving the envier to wander the corridors of a dualistic hierarchical universe. As the envier's motto goes, I envy all better than me and assume that all worse envy me. Enviers like to condescend to inferiors, noblesse oblige, but hate rivals who threaten their status. They love to see their rivals fail and grow alarmed at their rivals' success. Supersessionists have a particular problem with the endurance of the beliefs they're supposed to supersede. The more they insist on their claim of supersession, the more the now dépassé ideologies inexplicably remain rather than wither away, the more these supersessionists tend to see their displaced pre predecessors as enemies who threaten their identity, even their own existence. They become, these uh, predecessors become not representatives of immorality or of moral failure, blindness, whatever, but of evil incarnate. To summarize two millennia of Christian anti-Semitism, as long as Jews continued to reject Christ, i.e. refused to convert to Christianity, he remained nailed to the cross where their rejection had put him in the first place. One might suspect a certain kind of Oedipal complex at work here, in which one must kill the parent in order to fully triumph. With this psychological dimension in mind, much of supersessionist discourse, including theological and juridical, juridical being, for example, the Dhimmi laws in Islam, <coughs> um, becomes comprehensible as a form of aggressive inferiority complex. Let's focus now on a less obvious, even unconscious form of supersessionism, namely secular supersessionism. Secular supersessionism began with the children of the Enlightenment, who believed that their worldview had replaced and surpassed those of earlier religions. In the current generation, it is the global progressive left, who with their pomo poco critical theory, believe that they are the moral cutting edge of the global community. And like their monotheistic predecessors, this secular superstitionism has a particular problem with Jews. 
For some, it's just an irritation. Jews, specifically the Jews' belief that they're chosen. For some, it's just an irritation. Who do these people think they are? In others, it manifests as something of a preoccupation, a key component <coughs> in identity. Among those preoccupied with Jewish notion of chosenness, there's a school that project, projects its own motives onto the Jews, imagining that the Jews' notion of chosenness is hostile and domineering. Such obsessions culminate in the paranoid fear of a Jewish conspiracy to enslave the world, historically and contemporaneously pressed most intensely by those with precisely such plans, namely the Nazis and the global jihadis. <coughs> they revel in tales of Israel committing war crimes because it affirms their belief in Jewish malevolence. At its murderous Oedipal extreme, current secular supersessionists have a new replacement theology. Jews with power are the new Nazis, the Palestinians the new Jews, or what Alan Johnson called yesterday Holocaust inversion, also known as the, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, the, the Nazion or Nazion thesis, which went mainstream in the late, two, in late 2000. Being secular, progressives can't have a God choosing them, but in assigning the historical symbolic roles of Nazi and victim to the Israelis, or Nazi and Jew, to the Israelis and Palestinians, they place themselves morally above everybody. The Jew, whom we envy, is now the new evil, Nazism being the secular incarnation of evil, and Palestinians, to whom we condescend, are the pitiable victims of the new genocide. I would not dwell on this issue of malevolent envy so long were I not forced by the astonishingly self-destructive behavior of the progressive elites, especially in Europe, at the turn of this, la this last millennium, in other words, 15 years ago. Behavior that has disastrously persisted for the first 15 years of the 21st century. The astonishing phenomenon was the immense popularity of a school of what I call lethal journalists in Israel who did their best to present the news as news, Palestinian war propaganda about Israeli malevolence, child murderers, civilian massacres, etc. And they did this continuously despite the damage to their intellectual integrity on the one hand as information professionals and the damage to their own progressive societies and values on the other. For every time Israel has tried to stop attacks in its civilians since 2000, the world news media has gone into a frenzy of lethal journalism that brings home the message of Israel attacking Palestinian civilians and making them suffer terribly. What Europeans did not seem to or want to understand is the impact of this war propaganda on the Muslims in their midst. It brought searing images of Muslims suffering at the hand of cruel Jews into their living rooms. It was an immensely powerful flag of jihad. It reinforced the sense of being under siege and under threat that is one of the core beliefs uh, driving jihad in our day. Each wave of this journalism brought angry protests in the West, both by people self-identifying as the global progressive left and triumphalist Muslims whose hatred for Israel has elective affinities with global jihad. As a result, the soft power moral giant, European Union's public sphere, played host to Muslim protesters shouting death to the Jews in European capitals for the first time since the Holocaust. And that happens, first time that happens is October 6, 2000, Place de la République, a demonstration against Mohammed Adoula. Progressives either stood by or joined in, and journalists all of a sudden fell, fell silent. The role of lethal journalism and anti-Zionism in creating an aggressive Muslim street in Europe and around the world in the 21st century is, I think, one of the major research projects that we should be undertaking. What madness could lead, <coughs> what madness could lead moral Europe to energize a Muslim subculture in their midst of paranoid conspiracy theories about Jews that praised hero martyrs who went down killing Jewish kids in revenge for what the Israelis were doing to Muslim children in the Middle East, 
Did they really think they were not also the targets of that hatred? And the more progressive, the more the hated? Why were they not paying attention? Well, I contend that this envious supersession, that envious supersessionism informs the global progressive left's new replacement theology of Nazism. In response to the staged image of Mohamed Adura, Catherine articulated the lethal journalist's variant of secular replacement theology. This image, this death, sick, this death erases, replaces the picture of the boy in the Warsaw Ghetto. It's really hard to find something that expresses the moral disorientation of European elites at the turn of the century than this remark. A year later, a year later, Adula was the patron saint of the Durban Council. He was carried around in effigy. There were huge signs surrounding him everywhere he went. Two years later, after a second paroxysm of lethal journalism around the Janine massacre, we find a French secular Jewish philosopher and sociologist. I don't want to make fun of the French, but I got to say, I think they're the only people who actually claim to be philosophers. Um, I mean, not all French, but they're, <laughs> I think French are the only people who claim to be philosophers. <coughs> Edgar Morin laid out the Nazi on thieves theory. He wrote, it's hard to believe that a nation of fugitives born of the most persecuted people in the history of humanity have experienced the worst humiliations, suffered the worst contempt, would be capable <coughs> of transforming themselves in two generations into a people sure of itself and domineering. And here he is quoting, of course, uh, Charles de Gaulle's uh, November 67 um, uh, press conference, which, with the exception of an admirable minority, meaning me and my friends, <laughs> turned into a people who despise and take satisfaction in humiliating. Now, he may not have been aware of it, but in so speaking about the Jewish pleasure in inflicting humiliation, Morin confirmed the widespread belief that Jewish chosenness includes this contemptuous attitude towards the goy, which is echoed in Paulin's poem, which uh, uh, I think Alan uh, quoted uh, yesterday. So when Jews have power justified by their chosenness, they will inflict harm on Gentiles. The news from Israel confirms that belief spectacularly and repeatedly. In response to yet one more round of lethal journalism, this time from Gaza in 2014, Operation Protective Edge, one Irishman wrote an apocalyptic poem that begins with a plaint for the wretched Palestinian victims and ends with a long passage in which the poet speaks with what he thinks is the voice of the Jews. We will the killing to continue and continue and continue. How could we not? We must not, no, no, cannot, will not consider the sacredness of life, the other, the weak, the children. No, we revel in our treasure spun of stolen lands, a God created in our image, draping our souls with hate and fear enough to warm our hubris. We all stand, all, we are the chosen unto the planets. We need no other, want no other, will have no other, suffer no other. No, 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 for we are, we are, we are. That's what he thinks Jews think. <laughs> well, thanks for that applause. Perhaps the most startling expression of this deeply supersessionist response to lethal journalism came from Jostein Garder in 2006, writing in the Royal We, and right after the Farkana incident, writing in the Royal We of the global progressive left, the popular science writer Garder unloaded his contempt for his projected notion of Jewish chosenness. We don't believe in the notion of God's chosen people. We laugh at this people's capriciousness and weep at its misdeeds. To act as God's chosen people is not only stupid and arrogant, it's a crime against humanity. We call it racism. 
There are limits to our patience. There are limits to our tolerance. Mind you, I'm giving you an abbreviated version. We do not believe in the divine promises as your justification for occupation and apartheid. We have left the Middle Ages, often heard in the expression, for crying out loud, is the 21st century. We have left the Middle Ages behind. We laugh uneasily at those who still believe that the god of flora and fauna and galaxies has selected one people in particular as his favorite and give it, given it silly stone tablets, burning bushes, and a license to kill. We call, such, we call baby killers baby killers, and we will never accept that people such as these have a divine or historic mandate excusing their outrages. We do not recognize the rhetoric of the state of Israel. We do not recognize the spiral of retribution and blood vengeance that comes with an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We do not recognize the principle of ten or a thousand Arab eyes for one Israeli eye. And here I think he's riffing off the Human Rights Watch tweet, um, which uh, Gerald mentioned in his talk. 2,000 years have passed since a Jewish rabbi, guess who, criticized the ancient doctrine of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We do not recognize a state founded on anti-humanistic principles and on the ruins of an archaic national and warlike religion. Or, as Albert Schweitzer expressed, humanitarianism consists of never sacrificing a human being for a cause. This, I submit, is the envious voice of moral supersessionism, incapable of even disguising its religious origins. Here's the classic malevolent pattern. Envy your rivals in global morality, the Jews, and condescend to those you consider so namely the Arab Muslims, that you rob them of their agency in order to assign them the role in your drama of victim of the Jewish Nazi. The cruel exploitation of the Palestinian refugees cannot work without this malevolent dynamic. Garter seems completely unconscious, no irony in this text, that in his moral indignation he has actually inverted morality. Indeed, in supporting the Palestinians, he won't call them baby killers even though they do so deliberately. He accepts that they have a, quote, historic mandate excusing their outrages. He promotes the creation of a, quote, state founded on anti-humanistic principles and on the ruins of archaic national and warlike religion. I would change archaic national to archaic tribal. Hard to get it more upside down. Somehow, in his need to see himself as the standard bearer of the great humanitarian voices from Jesus to Schweitzer, he does not recognize, realize that he incentivizes the jihadis to try and maximize the misery and death of their own people as long as people like him and lethal journalists continue to blame Israel. What other than a malevolent and self-destructive envy could drive a progressive to join global jihad in viewing just to those who are here assembled in our effort to direct our attempts to confront this problem of anti-Zionism as the new anti-Semitism, I suggest we pay attention to this phenomenon of secular supersessionism. For example, I'll bet it's specific memes, the, all this stuff about all oh, the Jews and their chosenness and their disgusting and their license to kill, these memes rival those of Nazi memes in tweets and other uh, forms of communication. Because I think it informs a great deal of the hostility to Israel, especially on the left, both secular and religious. Supersessionists have an almost limitless appetite for the poisonous lethal narratives about Israel and various groups of information professionals have made successful careers meeting their needs. From the Pomopoko Academy to the lethal journalists to the human rights activists and their reports to as a Jew, catch a Jew, alter juif who rise to the status of prophet by denouncing their people ferociously in the language and in the courts of their enemies. 
And here I do not think our focus should be on the al Juif. There's a lot of talk about what do we do about these crazy Jews who, who are obsessed with admitting, accusing us of everything, including being Nazis. I'm the, I got a last paragraph, that's great. Okay, and here I do not think our focus should be on al Juif. I think we need to speak to Gentiles, what triumphalist Muslims would call infidels, whether Christian, post-Christian, Muslim, post-Muslim, or anyone else, we Jews can't really shut these al Sharif up because we have so disputatious and self-critical a culture, which we love, that we're constantly producing pathological cases of hyper-self-criticism and our capacious rules of tolerance forbid us from repressing them violently. It is for you outsiders to divest from supersessionism. There's a divestment movement more at this time. <laughs> divest from supersessionism about Jews in Israel and find the strength to say no to that poison of moral schadenfreude that comes with lethal narratives. The rabbis say make yourself a friend, make yourself healthy Jewish friends. Ones who side with their own people, not those who side with their enemies' people, and morally and cognitively disorient you.